In this video, I will show you how to paint any character illustration in six steps. We bring you tonight's exciting story. Light. That's all there is to it. We'll be using Clip Studio Paint, but the theory behind everything we'll see today applies to any illustration software. Before we get to painting, we need to talk about lighting. There are two things that you always have to keep in mind where the light is coming from, and with what intensity. But Manu, what about the color of the light? Nope, the color doesn't matter. Wait, what? Yep, let me explain. When I was working on this study of a painting by one of the old masters, JC Leyendecker, I was trying to copy the same exact colors that he used to paint it. Light blues and purples and red and oranges and greens, because I had no idea how he could keep control of using all those hues and the painting still having volume. So hearing that, you may think, then how is it possible color doesn't matter? Well, if I make a new layer, fill it with a black color and change its blending mode to saturation, we will get a black and white version. And I want you to notice how clear the two things that I told you are here. Direction of the light and its intensity. So by turning this to black and white, you will realize if your values are working up front, you can use whatever colors you want and your piece will still work. Values in art is a scale that goes from absolute darkness all the way to complete white and allows us to measure how bright or dark an object is. Now the key to using values correctly is making the most of this entire range. This is why you always hear artists recommending to push your values. And it's exactly what I did in my first short film. I always had a big range between darker tones and really bright whites. And again, if your values are working up front, you can apply any colors that you want and your piece will work. So let's jump into it. I want to create an illustration of my original character, Seraphine. So this is the line art that I will color. If you're wondering what I did before this line art, well, really nothing special. With this line art as a guide, we can get into step one, which is the color flats. This is the actual color that the object has without worrying at all about the lighting. It's important that you do it cleanly because these color flats will also double as selections that we can use when we are rendering each part of the character. I recommend these settings in your fill or bucket tool. Use the close gap function so the color doesn't spill and also the area scaling. That way your fills will bleed out a little bit under the line. And you just have to paint your color flats on different layers depending on what part it is. For example, I separate the skin in one layer, the hair in another, her clothes and her small details. You can use the different layers not only as selections, but also as clipping masks. You can create a new layer and place it on top of the layer you want to use as a mask. Then click on the clip to the layer below button. Now I can draw a single light blue stroke and you'll see it will only show on top of where the pink hair is. This is really useful to create the gradient on her hair without worrying about painting it carefully. Once we're done with our color flats, we can move on to step two. But before we do that, we need to talk about what my light source will be. This is what my final background will look like. And yep, it will be all blurred out. And I will touch upon exactly what I did here at the end of the video. But what's important about this is we need to talk about where my light is coming from. First of all, you can see Sarah will be standing in the middle of an alleyway where there are several light sources, but none of them would really cast that much light on her. What is really gonna be the light source is this. So behind her, I wanted to have these gigantic letters just floating in the air. And of course, they will be casting light from behind. Now, if I only had a light from behind on her, her face would be really, really dark. So the other idea I had was to have a fake light coming from the ground around here, and it would be light blue to contrast the light that's coming from these letters, which I would just sum it up to be some sort of pink light. Once I know where the light source is and her environment, now step number two will be an integration pass. For example, right here, the character's colors, his sweater is red, his hair is blue, but is it really? If I use the color picker right now, you will see this color is actually a brownish orange. So how did I end up with that? If I turn everything off, you'll notice that by having the character like this, even if I added some green shadows, it still feels like he is not there. 
This is because this red and this blue and even the color of his skin are not being contaminated by the rest of the scene. So one way to do that is to grab our color fill layer, duplicate it, and with this button right here, I will colorize it. Now I can choose the layer color, and let's just grab a green from the background. Click OK. And if I apply this on top of the character with a blending mode, for example, color, well, you'll see this doesn't work. But let me lower the opacity all the way to zero and start bringing it up. And it is around here that it suddenly feels like this is a red contaminated by a green room. This integration pass is what allows me to use whatever color I want and still make it feel believable. In the case of our illustration, what we'll do is grab the entire folder where I'm placing the color flats and left click on it by holding the control key and this will create a selection. I will fill the entire thing with a blue color. And in the same way I colorized my animation, I will use a blending mode and lower the opacity of this blue to make the character feel like she is standing in the middle of that background. See how it contaminates all the local colors? And again, I'm not worrying about the lighting yet, just making her feel integrated to that place. In this case, one small detail that I will save is grab the layer for the red eyes color fill and move it on top of everything, because I don't want it to be affected. Once we have this, we can actually start applying the light. Which takes us to step three, adding highlights. This is one of the funnest parts of the process, where again, you just think of where your light is and how intense it is, and then apply it to your character. In this case, if the light source is the letters that are behind her, then I will create a rim light, which is a highlight all around her silhouette that creates a lot of contrast and also separates her from the background. I can also start painting some other little details, like this in her hair. I can also add some light in the side of her nose, just to rescue that shape. This is just one light, but remember we spoke about having two lights. If I just left this rim light and started painting shadows, the entire character would be tremendously dark. That's why I decided to add a fill light that's coming from below. With Ctrl pressed, I will left click on my skin flat color layer preview. Just like with the folders, clicking this small preview will create a selection that I will use to paint this bounce light. And at any point you can see here what blending mode I am using. Fill lights are not as sharp as rim lights. So I will use a softer brush and paint it with a big cadence. This is why we spoke about light direction and its intensity. Because it's not the same to have a really bright light right behind you to a more tenue light below you. And the cool thing about art is you don't really have to be realistic as long as it's believable. So experiment away. One of the coolest things about this pipeline is since we have everything in separate layers, if at any point I feel any of the colors is not working, I can just go to the layer and press Ctrl plus U to trigger the hue and saturation adjustment and just qualify it to my heart's content. Now for step four, we're gonna talk about shadows. It's important to use color in your shadows. Even if it's really desaturated, you never want to paint with black, because then you lose the ability to play with that. The key to shadows is not to think of them as something you paint on the subject, but it's actually the absence of light that causes a shadow. So the lights will be the ones who tell you where a shadow should be. There is three types of shadows. This is an old drawing from 2017, but it has a perfect example for the first two. So the first one is cast shadows. Whenever there's an obstacle between the light source and the subject, a cast shadow will be cast upon it. And they're characterized by their sharp edges. Some examples here would be how her metal ears are casting upon her head, and also her arm casting a shadow on her belly. In contrast to this, we have form shadows, which are the shadows that happen when the object surface shies away from the light source and they are characterized by actually a soft edge. An example of this would be the cadence here, which is actually way softer than this sharp edge, as you can see, and also, well, on her butt. <laughs> so you have to take this into account when painting shadows on a character. The third type of shadow is contact shadows, also known as occlusion. These are shadows that exist where two surfaces make contact and they are there regardless of the light source. This is an important pass because it's the one that gives volume to the object. 
For this illustration, this is our occlusion pass. And you can see it's strongest whenever there are two surfaces that touch each other. If we add our highlights, you can see how much it's already carrying the weight of the illustration. If we turn on our local colors, it's already there. Just need to make our integration pass stronger and it feels like the character is right there. We're gonna take it further with our step five, the material rendering pass, where we basically go in and make everything feel like what it's made from. So making skin, looking like skin by adding some subsurface scattering. You can see the red sum pattern here. Also a little bit on her eyelids. For the hair, I'm going to add highlights and texture. Add some glow with the add glow blending mode to her chest light and render the material of her armbands, which in all honesty, I let her get rid of, but only because it was calling too much attention. This is a game of patience, but also a game of using references. If you're not sure how to paint any of these materials or parts, I recommend you look up a similar art or photograph and try to imitate what you're seeing. Once we're done with our details, we finally get to our step six, the post-production, which is basically making the image look as good as it can get. These are broad changes like gradients on top of everything, using blending modes like add glow to make it lighter, overlay to make it more saturated, or multiply to make it darker. It's up to you to decide what's the effect you want. Now, one really cool tool that Clip Studio offers, which is basically free social media content, is going to file, time-lapse, and export a time-lapse. Now, in order for this to work, you need to enable record time-lapse since you started working in the file. For example, in this case, I only recorded painting the character. So you just have to go to this export time-lapse button, and here you will have the video. Now you can choose what length you want it to have, what size you want it to be, or a different aspect ratio. Just click the options that you want and click OK. Let's talk about the background. We turn off the character and the letters. So to get to this, what I actually did is import a 3D model into Clip Studio and paint on top of it. This is a model I got from Sketchfab created by Stephanie Jablonowski and it was posted under the Creative Commons Attribution License. I also messaged Stephanie to get their permission. You can check out a link to Stephanie's work in the video description. So thank you so much, Steph. Let's turn everything off. Here's my layer for the 3D model, and you can see I can actually move any of the individual pieces. If you're using the Operation tool in the Object mode, you can also go to the Tool property, which is under Window, Tool property, and here you can select how the 3D object will be rendered and even where the light is coming from. I will not go too deep into this because I know not everyone will use a 3D model. So once I imported a model and set up my shader options to a look that I like, then I just painted the sky, colorized everything blue, and started to add details with the same pipeline that we've been using with our characters until I was happy with it. Then I right click and selected Merge Visible to New Layer. And this creates a new layer with everything that's in frame, but this is just an image. So we can hide the actual model and work on top of this image. I did some adjustments with curves. And once I was happy, I went to filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And I ended up blurring the entire background because that gives it a lot of depth. But if you don't want, you don't have to do that. This is our final result without the background. Here's with the background, you can see how it feels integrated. And if we add the light source, it blends it perfectly. Now the real key aspect to your success in painting an illustration is not really in the painting, but actually using references. As many as you can, take your time to actually look for things that you like, not only in the lighting and color, but in the drawing, the pose, the background, and even the story. All professional artists use reference. And if you're wondering what brush should I use to paint, I recommend you take a look at my ultimate guide to Clip Studio brushes, which is coming up next. <laughs>